welcome to A Wee Bit of War, a podcast dedicated to telling the stories of Northern Ireland during the Second World War. I'm your host, Scott Edgar, and in this episode, we're taking a somewhat festive trip to the flicks with Alan Smith. Alan is the nephew of Brian Desmond Hurst, a Belfast-born, acclaimed and accomplished director of feature films and documentaries, both during and after the Second World War. Alan, welcome to the podcast. Uh, We're delighted to finally have you join us. Um, We had originally planned to record something on location earlier in the year, but plans went awry and now with a a cold chill in the air, but that means a warmer podcast session for all involved. That cold air, however, also signifies that it is almost Christmas, and that's where we're going to start this episode with perhaps Belfast's greatest festive film gift to the world. Well, Scott, thanks very much indeed for the introduction. And yes, let's just jump straight in there. So it's not me that's saying this. It's not you that's saying this. Let's go to Leonard Moulton, um, America's top film critic, who said sometimes the stars just align and make a great film. And that's what ex- exactly what we have with a film called Scrooge. But in America, they call it A Christmas Carol. It's got Alistair Sim putting in the absolute performance of his life. It's a proper Christmas story, so don't start mentioning Die Hard and all the other things that are thrown at me at this time of year. Um, I've had enough of that. It's a proper Christmas story. It's set on Christmas Eve. It's a story of a miserable, money-driven fool who finds redemption. And it's that charting of the whole redemption and Sim's performance that gives you the great Christmas film. But also, and not a lot of people know this, it was both produced and directed by a boy from East Belfast who used to pick bread up off the street. And that's where we're going to start the story. Now, that boy in East Belfast was Brian Desmond Hurst and you have a great knowledge of all things to do with uh, Brian. For those listeners who don't know you, uh, what is your connection to what I and some others would call Ulster's greatest movie maker? So we're getting the news out there. It hasn't always been an easy process of getting that message out there but people are starting to buy into and understand and actually love this very flamboyant, very lavish film director that came out of East Belfast. So his name, Brian Desmond Hurst. Um, my job is I'm, I'm the administrator of the Brian Desmond Hurst estate. So I look after his literary and his film estate, um, but it also means that I've got a job to do in helping publicize um, the news about Brian and um, remind people that he came from Belfast. He was born and bred in Belfast um, and he's one of our world-class artists. Now, it's easy for me because the formal bit is you know, I administer the Brian Desmond Hurst estate and all that stuff. But actually, Brian was my um, uncle. Technically, great, great uncle. But to us and family, he was just Uncle Brian, a man who came to our house and filled our heads with wild stories of Hollywood and Roger Moore and John Ford and all of these stories, Uncle Brian, but I look after this state and and want to shout a little bit more back home about what he did and what he achieved. Well, we are going to help you with that on this episode. Uh, We'll be uh, shouting both, both throughout Northern Ireland and across the world with this episode, and hopefully everyone will know a little bit more about Brian by the end of it. Um, We know him as Brian Desmond Hurst, but that's not a name that you'll find in birth records anywhere. Um, You've touched on a couple of little facts there, but can you tell us a little bit more about Hurst's early life in Belfast? Yeah, no, I think that's important, Scott. So we'll just drill down into that. So he was born Hans Moore Hawthorne Hurst, 12th of February, 1895, 23 Ribble Street, just off the Newton Arch Road. So the old houses in Ribble Street are long gone. There is a 23 Ribble Street there. It's not that house. The old the old houses have gone. But as you walk down the Newton Arch Road, you get a real spirit of Brian's upbringing. 
So uh, he lived in, um, I'm just trying to get all the names here because there's a lot of them. And you'll have people listening to this podcast that are living in those streets and going, hold on, hold on, this this guy was from here. So um, Tamar Street, Finvoy Street, Welland Street, Conswater Street, Armitage Street. Um, he was pure East Belfast. He went to school in what is now the Con Club. As you drive down the New Norwich Road, you'll see it there. If you look on the side of that, you'll see Public Elementary School, i.e. the New Road Public Elementary School. That's where he was schooled, just across the road from Ribble Street, actually. If you go um, a little bit further into um, Conswater Centre and go to the back of that towards the car park, you'll find an old linen factory. The Bloomfield Linen Factory, to be precise. The walls are still there. That's where he worked. So he was pure East Belfast. Born, bred, schooled, worked. Bored, August 1914. You're bored in Belfast. What do you do, Scott? Well, like many from East Belfast, uh, young Hurst uh, signed up to go to war. That's it. So I'm um, signed up with a fairly unique battalion. Now, I'm not a military person, so I don't completely get this, but I guess you'll have a lot of listeners that do understand this. But he joined the 6th Battalion, Royal Irish Rifles, quite a unique battalion because it recruited both from Belfast and to Dublin and was therefore very cosmopolitan in its mix and outlook. So it was Protestant Catholic fighting side by side, Belfast man, Dubliner fighting side by side. Service battalion, so trained up. Put on a ship, long story, very short, end up in Gallipoli. End up in an area near the farm, right up in the hills. And on the 6th of August, they had a roll call, 25 officers, 750 other ranks. On the 10th of August, they had another roll call, two officers, 396 other ranks at that roll call. So that's 377 dead, wounded or missing in one night, possibly two nights of conflict. So when we get into these numbers, in today's terms, you, you just shake your head, don't you? So it's a service battalion, they're thrown in, and in one night they're wiped out. And there's probably a book and a great story in this chronicling, chronicling all of their lives. But for me, warfare and destroy men. But I, I think there was something there in the cosmopolitan nature of his battalion, the horror of warfare that was a spark for a bit of creative genius that subsequently we saw. Now, I can't prove that. You can't prove that. But, but, but on this occasion, we certainly see something sparked a bit of genius to take a linen worker, humble private rifleman, and then things started to change for him. He survived Gallipoli, came back to Belfast, um, and things started to change. And those things started to change uh, with that, that, let's call it that, that spark of creativity. And after the Great War, Hearst emigrated, um, I believe, first to Canada, um, and what, after leaving Belfast, he learned the film trade under the guidance of another world-renowned filmmaker. Well, well, that's it. And it was a hard story to put together. And one of the things we were able to do in the estate was gather together everything possible to do with Hearst. Um, and I started to do that in 2009 when I was appointed administrator. One of the things that we had was his memoirs. And in those memoirs, we were able to see I was here, I was there, and this is what happened. So you're right, Scott. He went from Belfast to Toronto and studied art. Um, he then went to Paris and studied art and then went to New York and studied art. It's for the best part of five, six years, maybe longer maybe maybe into the seventh year so a pure working class artist and i think that's going to resonate when we start to talk about the films because a working class background b an artist with a painterly eye 
and he he sometimes paints pictures with film and um we then get into the film side so he was in hitch, hitchhiked across america was in hollywood he was painting paintings were in the local shop john ford admired it didn't buy it came back the next day and the story was that charlie chaplin had bought it <laughs> john ford asks who was that young painter the shop owner explains that it was a young irishman who i think at that point was painting and constructing golf courses um, living around laurel canyon uh, in hollywood and um makes contact and it was that lucky break scott no more no less so ford inquired met brian they then uh, so brian had now called himself brian desmond hurst and um, people ask me why did he change his name from hans moore well i guess hans wasn't a great name to have after the first world war um brian brian brew irish regal desmond king desmond of ireland um, knowing br what brian was like he it was probably as simple as that he liked the, he liked the styling around brian desmond so um, Ford was introduced to this young uh, young man uh, and took him on as a painter in his art department in Hollywood. So that's that was his lucky break to getting getting into films. From there, he went in front of the camera and was briefly. Um, there's a few films where we can pick him out as an extra. Um, interestingly, one of them is actually side by side with another extra who goes by the name of John Wayne. Uh, the stories as you penetrate into them we've got the film we've got them side by side we, we, he was there no ifs no no buts and then move behind the the, the, the camera into film direction um, first assistant director uh, and, and then built up his film making pedigree circa 1932 he comes back from Hollywood having learned the trade sets up in London and starts to make his own films and from that moment on Hearst made many noteworthy films but as we're a second world war podcast we're going to focus on a couple of the wartime greats in this episode um this year marks the 80th anniversary of the arrival of american troops in northern ireland a momentous occasion that Hearst committed to film in what critic mike caddo stated was a film that everyone in northern ireland should see so mike mike is a great film critic and film historian and and everything that he says i listen to very carefully um and he he when he was a, a a professor and teaching at university used to get his students to watch this film as an exemplar in documentary filmmaking and the film we're talking about is called a letter from ulster filmed over the summer of 1942 it's all about the American troops that came across from the US and were training in Ulster. So Ulster became their home, their training ground. Remember, a lot of these guys were 18, 19, away from home, probably for the first time, not just away from America, but away from home and living and preparing for probably the biggest episode of their lives. And they were here they were all over northern ireland so the documentary is probably the first proper northern ireland documentary and it's called a letter from ulster now some of our listeners may not yet have seen a letter to ulster we of course uh in in this podcast would heartily recommend that they do so after listening um can you set a bit of the scene for us just um what what what's the overall story um what is the letter concerned well scott i'm hoping that yeah people after this will jump on and we'll talk a little bit more where you can see it because it's just a click and you're there and you can see it um very easy to access um so turning again to brian's memoirs he says that in the early 1942s spy german spies in dublin were putting it around that the american forces were acting like an army of occupation in northern ireland and beating up the local ulstermen and basically 
everything was not fine at all. I just add that Brian in his memoirs says after this allegation that the Americans were beating up Ulsterman, Brian did add as if anybody could. Anyway, we'll leave that to one side. Um, so his brief was very simple. Now, we just need to penetrate back a little bit further. 1939, the very first war film released was called The Lion Has Wings, which Brian directed in conjunction with um, Powell. And um, that was almost entirely scripted and put together by an organization that was then in its infancy because they sprung it and started it probably two days before the Second World War was started. But it was what became the Ministry of Information. And then in 1940, Brian was making propaganda films for the Ministry of Information. 1942, Minister of Information has a vehicle called the Crown Film Unit. So Brian was, was already working there. He was brought in to make a film to basically show the Americans back home that their kids were okay and to show everybody in the UK that everything was fine in Northern Ireland. The trips were settled in. Everybody was getting along fine. That was the brief. And boy, did he execute it. Because what we have is a really, really razor sharp documentary and a superb piece of propaganda because it does exactly what it set out to do. Uh, that was the brief. Now, everything has a magic ingredient, just like Scrooge had with Alistair Sim and Brian both producing it and directing it so he could shape it himself. With this, the magic, the magic ingredient was the team. So Hearst had been making propaganda films for quite a while, two years. He brought in a young script writer to, to basically script out the story. And the script guy, young script writer was his protege, who is um, Sean Terence Young. You need to drop the Sean, and then you'll see Terence Young, and then you just check his credit lists, and you'll see that 20 years later, he directed Dr. No, Thunderball, From Russia With Love. So a, a great cinematic genius was his script writer. And then his assistant on this was a guy called William, or we know him as, as Bill, but William McQuitty, who was a producer of the first Titanic film I night to remember. So it was a great little team that came together to make this with a great script, very clear briefing, and, and the output is su superb documentary making. It is an absolutely superb uh, documentary. Um, we we'd mentioned earlier there about what you called Brian's painterly eye. Uh, one of the beautiful things about this film for me is the the stunning scenery and the the absolutely beautiful backdrop that Ulster provides throughout. Um, a lot of a lot of people that listen to our podcast do enjoy a bit of a then and now comparison. So can you give us any uh, inside information on, as to where the film was shot? So, um, yeah, we've got it all. We, 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 we've worked out pretty much everything. And as you go through it, you'll, you, you, you'll see it. Um, so in the early stages, we're up in uh, the Bellarina estate, which is very close to Limavady. Um, and that's where they you, you, you see at the start. Then they cross over to some artillery training, which is in the Spurrens. The unit were then moved down to Tynan, Tynan Abbey in Armagh. And a lot of the training that you see is around the grounds of Caledon and Tynan. And the, at that stage, there's quite a lot of, um, there's, there's some kids that are brought in to help the Americans on a baseball game. And a few people have contacted me to say, that's my Uncle Jackie and so on and so forth. So they, they did bring in, um, in, in some locals. There's the inevitable string across the border um, incident where um, the Americans and their little cheap go across the border and they're told that they're, they shouldn't be where they are. Um, uh, and that, again, is down near time. Hey, though, I was out in the peep getting the lay of the land. Red came to navigate for me. Hmm. I'll say it did. Can you tell me if this is the road to Enniskillen? Hey, it is. But how far is it? Well, if you keep on going the way you're going at the moment, 
It'll be about 200 miles by way of Dublin. But on the other hand, if you like to turn and go back into Ulster there, you might find it's only about five. You mean to tell us that we're in the free state? Hey, you are. Sergeant. Hello, boys. This is Northern Ireland, isn't it? Yes, that's right. There don't seem to be any boundaries around here. No, it is a bit difficult. Sometimes you don't know where they are myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, Sergeant. Good luck, well, boys. The guys at the end are then, um, they kind of do a, what I'd call a, a Northern Ireland tourist board advert. So the premise of the story was two guys, Dawn and Wally, that have to write home and tell their mum, hence a letter from Ulster, that everything's fine. So the two of them jump into their Jeep and they do this most wonderful tour. And I, you know, I defy the current tour tourist board to do something better 80 years later. So they go to Straban, they go to Derry Stroke Londonderry, they go to Carrick Fergus, they go to beautiful scene, Salton St. Mary's Church in Belfast. Um, and they say they go to Cold Rain, but the train buffs out there, if they watch the Cold Rain railway station, they will really scratch their heads. And uh, Scott, between you and I, it's actually Cold Traw. So, um, but, but um, really good pan across. And it was, again, just to show the folks back in America that look at this lovely car. A, their kids are okay they're training well and B look at this lovely environment they're, that they're in. And what I kind of think today is, you know, there's 300,000 troops went through Northern Ireland in the second world war. Just think about the number of grandkids there are now. It must be 2 million, mustn't it? So in the film, they've actually got a little template to go, hold on, granddad or great granddad was here and he was there and anybody coming back can follow that. So, I think it's worth a really good watch by um, anybody that watches your podcast. And we occasionally get get emails from people in America with all those stories of, you know, my, my grandfather or great grandfather was in Northern Ireland in 1942 or 1944. And they were at, you know, this place, that place. Um, can you tell us any more information? So we'd encourage anyone watching the film uh, if you're if you're in America you know feel free to get in touch with us and, and let us know um if your uh, ancestors or your family members uh, ever sent home a letter from Ulster um, although using some poetic license a letter from Ulster is a documentary and perhaps one of the first made in Northern Ireland yeah that that's that's what I'm told by folk that know about this I think there might have been some some what you call um information shorts for instance you know how to make silage in two easy steps but in terms of a 40 minute documentary a full documentary this is the pathfinder this this sets the way for you know all our great documentary makers that have now followed um for me though it's not just a documentary because brian in his memoirs kept talking and talking and talking about the, the real thing about film is film is a piece of art, just like painting or poem or a song. He wants the world to see his work as art. So sometimes I don't compartmentalize it into, you know, a documentary or a whatever. I just call it film film art. Now, it's a bit of a lone voice because I, I keep, I keep, I feel I have to keep pushing Brian's message. It's kind of, it's part of my estate duties, but I passionately believe that film is art. And when I look at the sort of documentary makers that we've got coming out of Northern Ireland now, um, yeah, I, I probably will mention a few names, people like Alison Miller, people like Brian Henry Martin. Um, there's a whole host of them, but, but we're doing, you know, great stuff now. Um, and I, I think everybody would want to call it not just a documentary, but it's their art. Um, so film is art. So um, I, I feel feel quite strongly about that.
I would certainly agree that um, that that film is art, and in particular, the the films, uh, Brian's films, are are wonderful pieces of art. Um, did did this particular film receive the attention it deserved? Um, how was it received in the United States? Well, in in his memoirs, Brian said he received a personal commendation from the President of the United States for this piece of work. And we know that it was certainly shown throughout America. I interviewed te- uh, 11 years ago, General John Jack Vesey. I, uh, he was a humble sergeant in uh, in Ulster in 1942. He went on to become uh, President Ronald Reagan's uh, head of his chiefs of staff. So in, in one way, arguably the most powerful military man in the world, and I was able to have a chat with him, and he just raved about this film. Uh, he talked about it being a real rock for everybody that was at home. Um, his colleagues and friends he can see on it. Um, so that came from a real passionate man who, who who wanted me to know this and took the time out to let me know this. So I felt really honoured to speak to him and to hear that. So. We know that it was really well received in, in America. They knew their boys were fine. They knew they were being trained. And uh, as far as I can tell, in in Northern Ireland, and maybe we'll come on to that in a section in, in, in a second. Um, yeah, it, it was well received as well. Well, yeah, let's let's come on to that because next month will mark the 80th anniversary of the premiere uh, of A Letter from Ulster in Belfast. And that was a rather grand affair. What what can you tell us about that night in January 1943? So the fact that we're talking now and, and you said at the start, you know, maybe it's a bit of destiny that we're talking now because we're bringing in Scrooge and Christmas. But we're also right on the cusp of um, the 12th of January. 1943 is when this little documentary was shown and they made a real fuss of it. So it was um, shown in the Imperial Cinema in Belfast. That's where it had its premiere. Um, the Prime Minister um, of, of Northern Ireland was there. The Colonel Dyke King, I think his name was, who was the General Officer Commanding of all the US forces in America, was there. And um, Basil Brook. So sort of the the... the, the, the the greats came out to see it on its premiere, and then it was cascaded throughout Northern Ireland. So we've got an opportune time, which is the 80th anniversary coming up of arguably Northern Ireland's first documentary, and probably um, one of the greatest still 80 years later documentaries. So it's great that you've given me this platform to to, to talk about it, and, and hopefully more people will will get to see it and Mike Cato may finally get his wish, which is everybody in Northern Ireland should see this film. Well, if we could get both everyone seeing this film and everyone listening to this podcast, I think that would be a wonderful outcome from this evening. Um, A Letter from Ulster wasn't Hearst's only wartime film. And this year, uh, talking of those small coincidences, um, this year also marks 80 years since the Siege of Malta, um, another event which inspired perhaps one of the greatest war films of the 1950s. Um, it, it's a great film, and it's a very personal film for me as well. So not only did Brian um, direct this, um, in fact, he was almost not going to direct it, and John Ford called him up and, and said, look, this is right up your street. You've got to do this. And, of course, of course Ford was a, a great um wartime film director with Midway and, and what have you. So um, he was propelled into doing it. So uh, the other personal point for me is my father-in-law was on a, a an aircraft carrier built in Belfast called HMS Formidable, and he was on the mall to co- uh, convoys, and we've got telegrams back from him. So, you know, helping get supplies through and and, and, and save Malta. So the backstory is it's, it's real David and Goliath stuff, is this little island, one of the most bombed square miles in Europe, in the whole of the Second World War, and it took an absolute pasting, but the people didn't give up. The RAF that were based there didn't give up. 
And the Navy, and importantly, the Merchant Navy, didn't give up and tried to get supplies through. So it's pretty much a story of the Navy, the Air Force, and the Merchant Navy. Um, it's a very human film. So I'm told by film critics that the one thing that Brian keeps bringing to his war films is humanity. And that's not surprising when you consider that roll call of his battalion. They were slaughtered. Scott, you know, they were, they, you know, decimated in the worst possible way. So his war films aren't blood and gore and flash and bang. It's tenderness, it's humanity, it's a story. It's, Walter's story is a great one because it's the story of the little man fighting back. Um, but the, the, the stars aligned on this one because he had an A-list class. So you got Alec Guinness, Jack Hawkins, um, went on two years later on, Another war film called A Bridge Over the River Kwai. But anyway, we'll, we'll focus on Malta's story. And, and also Anthony Steele was um, uh, with those two posters up behind me. Um, I think it's a great little film. But then again, it's not just me. There's a survey out last month, top 10 war films from the 1950s. And there you go, Malta's story in there. Um, so great to see that it's still being... Um, recognized still shown on tv still shown on streaming services um really pleased about it and, and again for folk from belfast and and, and around to know hold on this 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 guy from here did this stuff i think it just makes people sort of step back a bit and think yeah yeah that's that's good we we we, we can be proud of that and uh, I'm I'm living in East Belfast at the minute, and I know that uh, if anyone's living in in that area, if you go down to the Strand Cinema, um, which is just just off the Newton Arts Road there, there's a blue uh, Ulster History Circle plaque uh, commemorating uh, Brian Desmond Hurst's work up on the wall of the cinema. So his he is being remembered, and his films have been critically acclaimed um you know he's got great great fans among other filmmakers but do you think the films receive the credit they deserve and what would you say is the enduring legacy of brian's work i think scott if i'm absolutely honest if i go back 20 years ago there was the, the appetite just wasn't there for the brian story you know the film might be shown occasionally on uh, on bbc2 on a midweek time and, and 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 his story had almost gone but getting this state together and getting the archive together and starting to tell his story in the two books i'll mention those in a second i think i think the people are coming back and saying hold on yeah number one film is art number two when we watch his films we see we see that painterly eye and we also see those kind of john ford fordian elements so he does a lot of framing of pictures you know through a, through a, through a doorway just like Ford had done he really uses close-ups very sparingly but to underline important points um so I think we're getting that he was a great film maker I think we're getting that he made over 30 films over four decades across three continents I think we're getting that he's arguably the U Okay, one of the UK's greatest conflict film um, directors. At another point, Scott, we'll need to talk about Ourselves Alone. Now, that's great if you can get it on DVD. Banned in Belfast, brilliantly banned in Belfast, but sold out in London and Dublin. That's a whole different podcast. 1936, we've got a lion ha The Lion Has Wings. We've got, we haven't even talked about Theirs is a Glory, where he took 120 veterans back to Arnhem within a year from taking a heavy defeat defeat um so the legacy is continuing and building um directors guild of great britain plaque put up in queen's film theater it was only the fourth they put up um the first two included david lean and michael powell so bram was the fourth so the legacy is there um when the they opened the titanic film studios one of them is named the Hearst Sound Stage um I don't think a lot of people know that but there's there's a big plaque in there it was opened by the first minister deputy first minister and yeah 
one of them's called the Hearst Sound Stage. So we're getting there. Um, Scott, if I may, just a couple of things. We took Brian's memoirs and told the story of all his film life, all his film writing, Hearst on Film, just published last year, um, £1.49 on Kindle. So we've done this. Um, the paperback is more expensive because it's lavish. It's got a thousand pictures in it. It's 600 pages, but it's out on Kindle, £1.49. You know, young filmmakers, students, people interested in just films. Just there it is. Hearst on film available on Amazon. And um, the other one is just for the military fans. Um, there's It's a Glory. It charts Brian's 10 war films published by Hellion, um, military publisher, available on Amazon. I think it's £15. Um, David Truesdale, who's a military author, um, very, very knowledgeable, very accurate. Um, and then I wrote it with David. I bring in the film archive stuff. Um, so 10 war films that he made, and, and that's in, 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 in that book. So we're getting there, Scott. And I, I think it's a great story. Um, and then that's before we even get into the personal life of Brian, which is just an amazing story as well. Um, from rags to riches. And then actually he just blew everything in the end as well. If somebody enjoyed it, um, he gave it away. He had a very fine art collection. And, and if somebody admired one of his pictures, he gave it to them. That's the sort of man he was. Sounds like an absolutely wonderful man. And I think we'll we'll definitely have to have you back on the podcast to talk more about, about Brian's personal life and some of those other 10 war movies as well. Now, Alan, you're often found educating and informing people on, on all things Brian Desmond Hurst. Um, once people have listened to this podcast, once they've... Uh, Bought the, bought the books from Amazon or uh, their independent local uh, booksellers if available. Um, where can our listeners keep up with you with any news from the estate? And just as importantly, where can we watch some of these wonderful films? Okay, well, the, the go-to spot for anything information-wise on Brian, if there's an event happening or there's literally anything happening, is the Brian Desmond Hurst Legacy Facebook page. So if you simply go onto that, give a post a like, you'll then get notifications from it or check back in every now and again. Um, beyond that, there are several, um, I'd love I'd love to say more at the moment, but I'm sworn to secrecy, but there's several things that are happening next year um, around the Hearst story and around film is art and his work that that maybe we can come back and and talk about um when, when that comes to fruition but i can't i can't say anything more at the moment so the go-to space is the brand desmond Hurst legacy facebook page and um, accessing his films so if we want to go in and follow up this podcast a letter from ulster just go into uh, youtube google a letter from ulster we've remastered it we've put it up there enjoy it it's there it can be seen after you've seen that stay with youtube and go into revisiting a letter from ulster and that's where i made a documentary about 10 years ago and we walked re-walked the steps that dawn and wally did and went to the places that they went to to show up now so you know if we've got those two million grandchildren from the american servicemen out there that want to see it so revisiting a letter from ulster on um youtube and then when they come over here they can follow the steps other than that lots of his films are not that so the wikipedia entry and brian's filmography is correct off the back of that you can find most of the films now on dvd or streaming devices um dvd on either amazon or ebay and and you can start to pick them up and and follow them through and see a li little bit more of his film art so his work started in 1934 and finished in 1963 so um there's a, there's a good spread there but scott for me you know i i i just can't thank you enough for giving me an opportunity here to to, to share with you a little bit more about the the the, the history and the news 
And if I'm only got if I've only got one message for folk to take away, just please remember Brian's kind of epitaph, which is is film is art and should be viewed as such and should have just as equal prominence in the world of art as as pictures and songs and paintings and 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 if we do that then the job's done the job is done indeed what a, an absolutely fantastic message uh to wrap up this episode with um alan i can't thank you enough for uh joining us and um yeah i wish you all the best with those events and things that you have uh planned next year and we hope to chat to you again about those soon thank you very much thanks take care and, and goodbye thanks subscribe to a wee bit of war on apple podcasts google podcasts spotify or wherever you listen to your favorite shows that way you'll never miss an episode tell your friends tell your family tell your co-workers break all the rules of the official secrets act and why not leave us a review to help others find the podcast thank you for joining myself and alan smith and i look forward to your company again next time for another wee bit of war <laughs>